So thank you for um, the opportunity to speak with you today. I want to talk about the path to GIS data completeness on the evolution of engine and GIS data preparation or preparedness. Um, I chose this. Um, actually, let me just give my very brief bio. Uh, I work with uh, Datamark. Um, with Sandy there at Datamark, and I am a public safety GIS expert. <clears throat> I've been working in public, I'm sorry, in GIS with technologies uh, around 20 years plus now. I'm getting old, um, but the last 10, I've been had the privilege to work in either a 911 network, um, a call center itself, or uh, as a regional advisor to. Uh, law enforcement, fire operations, and communications um, hey. professionals on how they can leverage GIS technologies to increase the service to the citizens. So I've I've uh, really enjoyed um, the last ten years of my career even more than the first ten uh, because it was really work with a purpose, and I know that everybody who's in this special interest group can identify with that and understand exactly what I'm referring to there. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about GIS data completeness. And the first item up here, I'm just gonna talk over briefly, is that I understand that Arizona has been working on this uh, NG91 GIS data for a long time. And so I know that I don't need to start in with you know, do you have data? Do you have address points? Do you have road center lines? So we wanted to bring this topic, GIS data completeness, because it really is the next step in terms of you've begun the work, you've done gotten a lot of it done in a lot of places. Now you can really focus your attention on, is my data complete? So in, in the spirit of that, we want to take a stab at defining what completeness, data completeness, uh, so that you know what I mean when I say that, um, and then you can apply it to your your setup, your GIS data, your next gen 91 systems, your relationships with the folks that administer and those systems and request your data. Um, and then talk a little bit about how completeness impacts next gen 911. Uh oh. Right. You still got me? Oh. That that doesn't. Uh, how about that? Still like Jeff, you're on both um, phone and computer. Oh, we can't hear you at all. Last yet. Jeff, we hear we are just getting feedback. Um, I just had to mute you for that, um, but I'm seeing you in two times. I'm not sure if you've joined twice or not. <laughs> okay. There we go. Much better. How about now? Perfect. Okay, I don't know what happened there. I got confused. I thought I saw a warning that said I'd been booted out of the meeting. So I joined twice. Well, uh, two, double me is too much, but one is just right. So let's, uh, let's keep going. Sorry about that. Um, uh, then we'll talk about considerations in achieving your data completeness. And um, you guys, give me a warning if uh, when we're approaching time, because I know I had a very short amount of time for this and I'm just... I wasted a little bit of it there. Um, <clears throat> you've probably seen this graphic before, but I just want to lay the foundation of GIS 
data quality, data quality in general, but certainly applies to GIS and what we're talking about. Um, one is availability. Is the data available? Is it out there? Um, two is, is all the necessary data present? That's what I think of and what we're going to talk about completeness as. It's available and it's in my data set. And then it, that launches quite uh, lo logically into the consideration of accuracy, which is does data reflect the real world? Then timeliness, consistency, which we won't have time to really talk about today. Um, so <clears throat> when you talk about completeness, is all of the data, the necessary data available? I'm sorry, not available, but in my data set. There's a couple of angles or different approaches to uh, upon which you can ask that question. One is, are all the features in my data set? I have address points, sure, but do I have all the address points captured in the data set? Do they have a record? Attribute population is a whole other. So even if I have all of the address points, at least a substantially complete address point layer, and the address points are the place that I think of this the most, uh, do I have the right attributes populated? Or maybe I don't have all of the features in place, but I do have all of the attributes populated. That is a comment on uh, a data, GIS data completion. Um, and, and it's important to note that in large part, completeness is dependent on availability, right? That's what you go back to that uh, DQ ball there. If it's not available, then it couldn't be in my data set. If it's not available, then I couldn't attribute that particular field on that record. Um, and it is a natural partner or logical uh, predecessor of accuracy. So if I don't have the data, it's in my data set isn't complete, then I cannot really ask the question of the full data set, do you reflect the real world? And so in NextGen 911, uh, this is really critical that we're both accurate and complete. Um, I think everybody in in that realm understands, and I co-chair a Nina working group called the GIS Data Transition Working Group, where we're putting out a uh, information document about considerations for GIS data transition uh, from no data to some data to complete data sets. Um, and and so we had to identify the impacts in that group of uh, missing completeness for the call routing elements of NextGen 911, especially near boundary consider uh, conditions. Completeness of the data is actually very important. It's important in non-boundary conditions as well because if the if the address point isn't there. And for some reason, the road center line cannot be geocoded. That address can't be geocoded. Then uh, it's going to default route. Default routing may not be the end of the world, but it may cause some additional transfers, which is the entire effort behind NextGen 911 in uh, ridding the 911 call takers of having to figure out where to send an, a call because it came to the wrong center. So call routing is certainly impacted by the completeness of GIS data. I like to think of, and I've got a graphic, actually, I don't think I included it in this one. I've got a graphic that demonstrates this kind of visually with fishbone analysis that shows that lays over a PSAT boundary and shows that if uh, on, a, on a boundary condition, and I think of this especially in a multifamily housing scenario, on a boundary condition, if you don't have all of the, the subunits of that multifamily housing complex and a boundary comes through the middle of the property, then there are definitely going to be call routing problems and some transfers necessary or otherwise are going to take place. Um, then there's the location validation setting where uh, the location validation function of the ESINET, which is the 911 call on NG911 uh, IP network that runs uh, call routing, the location validation function before a call is placed, before services provision, has to have a unique representation of each location, each address, civic address in particular, so that it can validate for the service provider 
that this is a valid location. If those address points aren't in place and there isn't a road center line that can capture that address point, then it won't be able to validate the location. This will cause discrepancies. And then there's the whole discussion of the three day or the 72 hour turnaround, uh, which Sandy's gonna address later in another presentation that I would recommend you um, come and be a part of. Uh, so there's that, the, that context where it can impacts NG901. And then there's the legacy connections to NG901. You know, one of the things as we started working in this NINA working group, the GIS data transition working group, that struck me more than, than it ever had before was that, <clears throat> that there's going to be elements of the network out there, service providers, uh, and other reasons why some particular service providers aren't going to be able to to become NG911 uh, capable networks. And at least for some period of time, you know, probably the rest of my career and potentially everybody else's on this call, there's going to be a need to continue to manage legacy data for those uh, networks that aren't going to become NG901 compliant. Um, and, and that's a topic that, that I could nerd out with you on if, if you'd like to, but, and, and Sandy would, would do the same. But because that fact is the case, the data completeness of your, in, of your GIS data will impact those legacy connections. There's an element, functional element called the MSAG conversion service that's going to use the legacy fields um, to translate a, a PIDA flow format. And I, I'm sorry, I apologize for, for driving too much into jargon, but an NG901 location conveyance format to a legacy conveyance format. And if you don't have the right GIS data in place for all the right addresses, all the right road center lines that come along, it's going to impact the functionality of NG911 networks. So what can I do about this? How can I, con what, what can I think about to make sure that the completeness of my GIS data in terms of all the records being there, all the right attributes populated, um, get to the point that it needs to get in, you can do a, a few things. You can think about spatial and non-spatial data sets. As GIS professionals, we think about the spatial data sets and we think about the spatial data sets we don't have, but very often there's treasures, there's troves of treasure out there, non-spatial data sets. If you worked for a city or a county, there are other departments that have been tracking location information without being spatial for decades, right? Any kind of billing system, permitting system, uh, trash, you know, um, delivery optimization systems that deliver, that are concerned about the delivery of services to a point of service delivery, even though they aren't concerned about the spatial ramifications or analysis or considerations of that business, they have location information for you. They have addresses of, of I'm sorry, lists of addresses that you can take and use your spatial expertise and your spatial toolbox to turn into spatial data sets to supplement your address data set in particular. But even road center lines as well, there's non-spatial data sets out there that are tracking various and sundry things about road center lines that all you have to do is find out about them and turn them into a spatial data set. Secondly, I would recommend that you engage tools and processes that shine the flashlight in the dark corners of your data set that you do have. Because what you can very likely find is that the relationship between the address point and the road center line is broken in places that you didn't realize they were broken because you didn't have a tool or a process to shine the flashlight over that particular relationship in that particular place in your data set. <clears throat> uh, fish bones are a great way to do that because they actually examine the relationship between the road center line to the, to the address point where it can't create a fishbone. There's something wrong. 
in the ad in the road or the address where it creates address point. I'm sorry, fish bones, but they're um, not really nice perpendicular fish bones. It gives you a reason to examine those pieces of data and figure out that, oh, maybe we're missing something, missing an attribute, missing a record that would help um, not only increase the quality of the data set, but would make sure and ensure that it is a complete data set. Frankly, the third bullet point is true. If this will require dedication and a granular approach to data quality and quality assurance. That, you know, is a lot of work. Um, you'll need to be work smarter, not harder on this so that you don't kill yourself. But achieving GIS data completeness is, is something that you can achieve. It is necessary for next gen 911. Um, and there's a lot of ways that you can go about thinking about it outside the box and in perhaps in different ways that you didn't think about it before. So I had a very brief period of time today. Uh, I think we're uh, cl closing in on that time. This is all the content that I had. So if anybody has any questions, I'd love to uh, chat through them with the oh, remaining yeah, time. Only, only mm -hmm. one question came up and the question is, what are fish bones? Fish bones, one of my favorite topics. Um, fish bones are a data set that, make sure I don't ruin my screen here, thank you. <laughs> uh, they're a data set that compare the place location of an address point to the location that the same address would geocode to on the road center line. Um, and the fish bones, let me see, I don't have a great, I don't have an image of those in here. Um, visually, they, they really tell you a story about patterns in your data, about places where you flip geometry, about places where you're missing attributes, about places where you fat fingered values. Um, they help you see uh, if you have transposed address points or values of, of house number. A lot of the things it'll point out to you reflect more on your GIS data and a lot of the things they'll point out to you reflect more on the addressing because let's face it there's some bad addressing out there so uh, there's a lot of a lot of ways to create those fish bones um, some scripts and things like that that can help you do them some tools uh, certainly out there that can help you create those fish bones as well and I I actually could do an hour long presentation on that, but I know I don't have that time. No, you don't. Actually, I, I have to cut you off because we're going to move on to our next presenter. Thank you, Jeff. Uh huh. Thanks, okay, everybody. So for I, your attention. Oh, sorry, sir. No, that's it. So it looks like our pr next presenter is Brian Bond. So Brian Bond is presenting on collaborating with adjacent jurisdictions for next generation 911. Brian, are you comfortable doing your own introduction today, sir? Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Okay, so earlier I uh, was told that my volume's not very well. So I'm switched headsets. Let me know if you can hear me better. Sounds like I think you sound good. Okay. All right. Let me uh, get started here with uh, my presentation. And I guess I need to give back back my uh, presenter role. Sure. Let me start the slide. This is going to be a challenge. <laughs> because the WebEx is underneath the presentation. Okay, there we are. All right, let me know when you see my screen because why am I in the corner? Got you now. Okay, great off to the side. All right. Um, thank you for joining me. I'm talking about collaborating with juris neighboring jurisdictions, adjacent jurisdictions, the first year of COVID. And I uh, hope my, my uh, 
that this will be a long-lasting one, but I do believe we'll have another year of it. Um, I came up with this presentation um, was intended to help reduce efforts when working with neighboring service in service boundary alignments, um, outlining steps that could be done with neighboring system 911 systems. Um, again, this is a focus from a GIS perspective, but um, uh, I do want to, you know, have the question to a 911 system administrator or someone else. Um, how to build service level agreements or local government agreements for collaborating work. And there we go. So this slide is to set a background for why this presentation, why I'm doing this presentation today. I'm coming, um, again, from the GIS perspective, but uh, for the 911 system administrator or dispatcher, um, or a support contractor even, um, should be able to relate to collaborating with others and um, building boundaries, uh, boundaries such as who's doing what, not necessarily building polygons. So how this presentation came about, let me start with a personal story. Um, here in Yavapai County, I work with a few different agencies that have their own GIS staff. Oops, went the wrong way. How'd that happen? And we're going to begin in Sedona. Um, if you have not been to Sedona, you might recognize this picture of the red rocks, um, the red canyons and buttes. Maybe some of you that uh, might be joining today might be from the Sedona area or work with them. Um, if, if someone that works at the city or the district has joined us, we're here to learn about your city. So this picture among the dark clouds is still great views and opportunities that I wanted to share with everybody. So Sedona is an incorporated city, but in two counties. Yavapai is on the west, Coconino is on the east. Uh, this map is courtesy of the city of Sedona showing subdivisions in both counties shaded differently. In this presentation slide, it might be difficult to see those differences, but uh, maybe you can see that slightly different color and where that uh, county boundary comes in. Sedona Fire District is not in the city boundary, but it's a regional area around Sedona. The fire district also has a medical services boundary, a certificate of necessity. Um, which is, again, slightly different shape than the fire district itself. And this map shows the fire district, but in two counties. Because the fire district's not the same as the city boundary, the police and fire have different service areas. And you might think collaborating, that my talk about collaborating might be between fire and police. Let's review the collaborating participants here that I've talked about. Um, in order to ensure consistency in our data from all the sources that I have listed on the slide, um, when it comes to dispatching, you have about the same equal number of dispatching agencies in the Sedona area as we have in, as GIS people. Um, you are, are you keeping up with my story here? So obviously I've got a lot of players here. So when I'm talking about 911, we're talking about consistency between all the data. Um, what collaboration work um, might need to be done might need a, a written agreement. Um, is the GIS staff sharing data? That's all we're talking about. Uh, how about collaborating dispatching for fire and police? And don't forget about the Forest Service that's around Sedona. We have to dispatch for those. As we're dealing with a, a forest fire in our county today, we've dealt with fires that have crossed the boundary between Coconino and, and, Yav uh, and Yavapai in the past. So we need to have that consistency written out as a memorandum of understanding, 
mutual aid agreements or memorandum of of oh, I said it twice. That's weird. Why didn't someone catch that on my slide? I meant memorandum of agreements. So to bring out because <laughs> you didn't send it to me, Brian, to look at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to bring out the. Uh, my personal story, let's go ahead and, and bring this up to everybody's level now, not just Sedona. To start out, um, if you guys are building an agreement in your agency, how do you know which one is the right one for your purpose? Um, is your agreement sharing GIS data only? Maybe it's a memo of understanding is all you need. But because there's a need to support the project of building a next generation 911 system, and you're not just sharing street center lines, a memo of agreement is might be what you need. Um, let me slightly move off onto a soapbox here. Um, I feel like there's been a, a bit of disinterest, mainly in the GIS profession, um, about writing and, and making an, a, uh, an agreement. Um, because the GIS world has always been that relationship of, you know, I know you, so I'll share my data, I don't care, and then we also have state statutes that sort of say, hey, we should share. Um, but in 911, we're no longer just creating maps for public viewing. There's the NINA standards, the guidelines, um, which the entire 911 system is designing around. There's dispatch procedures, there's legal issues that could arise, there's 24 hours, seven days a week operations that we're building upon that GIS data. This may sound like a common sense to have a, an agreement for next generation 911 system, um, which is an official system. Legal agreements are a must in order to back the job of the 911 dispatcher. I asked at the beginning, creating an agreement for collaborating doesn't seem to be a GIS task, but it is. Um, what is needed in an agreement, though? First of all, I feel like a champion is needed, someone who's willing to start the discussion, see the necessary parties to the table, work with the legal teams, those lawyers, to finalize all the wording. The champion's not always going to be a chief uh, operating, a chief operations officer or a system administrator, but maybe, but those uh, staff would be those that might be the signing um, contracted authority to sign those agreements. Oops, error. Um, also, what are you agreeing to in sharing data with your neighbors? Are you doing it on a regular time frame? Are you collaborating both the, the work for edge matching for consistency? Are you updating in a certain time frame when errors are discovered? Um, are you sharing resources um, or providing a tool when there's turnover, when staff leave. We have to remember that different computer-aided dispatch, uh, we all have different computer-aided dispatch systems, so we all have a different goal for our data. Yet we're all also trying to work to build a next generation 911 system to help us with standards. So we have to figure out what's in that agreement again. Uh, more questions about uh, what, what we're agreeing on. We're only talking about GIS data. It's important to define what's being shared and how much detailed is in those agreements so that when new staff come on and replace the current GIS staff, the written agreement helps to define that GIS person's job. And of course, it's a good time to spell out other duties for the PSAP, agreeing on mutual aid might be added to an agreement. I mean, if you're gonna have, the right, have something in writing, 
why don't you use that same piece of paper to get two things, to kill two birds with one stone? Um, also, have clear roles for who's responsible, especially in the GIS world, when there's boundaries that might not stay the same forever. Disagreements could emerge and define how those problems are worked out. Um, this presentation was based off of this NINA document, which I have in, uh, uh, outlined here. And I was going to just pop it over on the screen just for a visual. And you can see this is one example of a, an agreement that I've used um, to help start that. I just want to share that, what it looks like. And you can see this is not something that um, the GIS person would normally do. But so it, it is possible. And uh, I wanted to share that example and this document so that you guys don't have to feel like you have to start from scratch. I want to thank you for attending. Uh, please find that champion in your agency to begin those agreements. Don't feel like those agreements will hold you back from achieving goals. I'd also like to thank the AJIC 911 committee and Cheryl Thurman with Terra, uh, Terra Systems Southwest for her efforts in building agreements, starting the discussion in the state for trying to build a template for us to use. Regardless of where the state is with the agreements, um, bringing up this topic has been a part of Cheryl's work, and I want to thank her for that. I'd also like to thank my session, session moderator, Sandy. And that's all I have today. Fantastic, Brian. Do we have any questions for Brian or for Jeff? We do have a few more minutes. Define my, where did we go? Did you have a question I came directly to you, Brian? No, I can't even find my screen anymore. <laughs> it's okay. <tiny> little screen. <laughs> okay, everyone. Well, um, that's uh, our presentations for this uh, portion of the um, NG911 sessions. I hope you'll continue to join our sessions throughout the day and tomorrow. Uh, this will allow you a few minutes to take a break before the sessions begin again. Thank you, Brian and Jeff, for uh, presenting to us today.